This story is called The House That Death Forgot by Josh Parker. Melinda hated driving at night. In fact, she did her best to avoid it. Short trips to the store if she just realized she ran out of tampons or had nothing for dinner after getting home. But she did her best not to go out after dark unless someone was coming to pick her up. So naturally, she found herself on the longest drive of her life tonight, with no moon, a few stars, and swirling clouds above her in acres of forest on either side. As so many unpleasant things in her life, this was her father's fault. She hadn't seen or spoken to the bastard in about 15 years, but just after falling asleep tonight. No, that was wrong. It would be yesterday by this time. Out of the blue, her phone rang and his voice was on the other end. I need you, Melly. Please, come now. He'd said just that, and the line went dead. The old ass was probably drunk, but he'd never called her before. Not since she was a child, and he was still trying to convince her mother to take him back. It felt like she'd been dreaming, waking up to hear his voice again after all these years. It sounded like he was crying. His voice sounded just the same as the last time she'd heard it. As though in a dream, she'd risen, dressed, and gotten into the car... She was well out of town and halfway to his old place before realizing that she had no way of knowing if he even still lived there. She'd received updates from her mother from time to time over the years about where he was. Last time she'd heard from her mother about him was seven years ago. Had he even stayed in one place that long? Not to her recollection. She had been seven when her mother finally had enough and showed him the door. Prior to that, a move had come every few months. The house they'd been living in was their longest stay in one place. A full 16 months. It turned into two years after that, and the next house had been the one she left when she moved out on her own. In all that time, she heard from him sporadically at best, and had finally decided it was best to simply forget about him. Until tonight, that is. She had found out after a two-hour drive that she had been right to wonder if he was still in the same place. His last known address was a sketchy apartment in a low-income area of a town she'd grown up in. Had he been number 24, or was it number 42? Hmm, maybe it was 14. It definitely had a 4. Didn't matter. His name wasn't on any of the buzzers. Bastard! Drunk of a father had called her at night, all but demanding that she come to him for reasons he didn't even feel were important enough to tell her over the phone and then just expected that she would know where he lived now. In a flurry of rage, she turned and marched back to her car, slamming the door and starting off in the direction she came. She was so angry, she didn't even look where she was going and missed her turn off. The next thing she knew, she was on a lonely stretch of road. Cars were sparse. But she took some comfort in the fact that she would pass one every half hour or so. Her dashboard clock now read 2.27 a.m. She'd been driving for more than five hours since leaving her house at night. Every five minutes or so, she checked her cell phone. Ever since realizing she was lost, she had checked her phone and found that she had no bars at all. She even stopped at a gas station. Closed, of course. Just sure there should be some service around there somewhere, but nothing. Take stock of your life, Millie, she thought to herself. You're over 30, you hate your job and your mother and you don't get along. You haven't seen or spoken to your father in just other half your life. You have no time for your friends or a relationship thanks to the aforementioned job that you hate. And now here you are, trapped on a road you've never been on before, at night, and you can't even so much as call AMA, let alone check Google Maps. What a smart lady you are. She briefly considered stopping and flagging down the next car that passed. She quickly realized the futility of that plan. Any car on this road would also have no service, so there was nothing for it. She'd have to drive until she saw a house. She'd feel bad for waking someone up, but there was no choice. She needed to find her way back to the main highway. But so far, all that she could see on either side was a sea of trees, mile and mile of trees. No light shining through the bows, no sign that anyone had ever been here before, except that there was a road and people were obviously still driving on it. There weren't any road signs other than the mile markers. Had she really found the middle of nowhere? She was just in the middle of this thought when her headlights illuminated something up the road, a square wooden sign, obviously made by someone other than the government. 
This wasn't a gas food or lodging sign, or a mile marker, or a distance to sign. This looked like the kind of sign advertising a private business that was nearby. So she slowed down in order to read it. Granny Royce's Roadhouse. Come stay the night at Granny's. She'll take good care of you. Room, board, low prices. Next exit. Her heart sped up. She certainly wasn't interested in spending the night at Granny Royce's, but every business had a phone. At the very least, she'd have a map. Or at least know the way back to the highway. She decided she would stop there. She almost missed the turn. Granny Royce's roadhouse was buried at the back of a long, dirt driveway secluded amidst the trees. She was almost past the little dirt road that led back to it before realizing it was even there. She skidded to a stop and turned in. The little house lay ahead. It was two stories and looked to have about eight to ten rooms. Big for a home, but small for anything announcing room and board. She got closer and looked for a vacancy sign. Nothing. It wasn't that the sign wasn't lit. In fact, there was no sign. The porch light was on and the front of the building was being illuminated by that light and her headlights. No other signs of any kind. She almost wondered if she'd gotten the wrong place. She was certain that she'd seen no other exits between this house and the sign announcing it. She paused in the driveway and took out her cell phone again. Still, no service. She did a quick search for any available wireless signals. To her complete and utter lack of surprise, there were none. Not even any that were secured. There's no one here but me, she thought. At this point, she wouldn't be surprised to find the house empty as well. But the light was on, and this was supposed to be a roadhouse. Someone would be manning the front desk. She got out of the car and headed for the front porch. As she turned around to make sure the lights flashed when she hit the lock button on her fob, she thought she could just see a flash of movement in the trees. Something human-shaped. But when she stopped and looked again, there was nothing there. So she decided that she just imagined it. At the front door, she hesitated. If it really was a roadhouse, then she should be able to just go in. But what if she got the wrong house? She tried the door and just walked in. She could find herself arrested out here and put fuck nowhere. Cautiously, she tried the knob. It turned, and she pressed gently on the door and it opened. Relief flooded through her when she saw that she was in a small but tastefully decorated foyer that had obviously been repurposed as an admissions area. A quaint desk with an honest-to-God guestbook had been placed in the far right corner. Some chairs had been set out along with magazines on a table. She read the titles briefly. Mademoiselle, Blue Book, The New Country Life, Arts and Architecture, before turning her attention to the little desk. There wasn't a computer. <laughs> that was a cute touch, she thought to herself. It was like the house was from a past era. Perhaps old Granny Royce didn't really like modern technology. There was, however, a little bell, just like there would have been in 1929. It wasn't even the round silver kind you slapped to ring. It was a little porcelain handbell. <laughs> This place was even starting to outcute her. Please let her have a phone. Please let it use number plan. Not 50s exchanges. She picked up the bell and gave it a shake. For a while, nothing happened. Then she saw a light come on in the back room and the shadow of an old woman sprang up on the wall. The shadow moved towards her and within a few seconds she saw its owner, Granny Royce, who perhaps looked like every grandmother in every storybook ever. Well, goodness me, she said. My lands, good morning, dearie. Pardon my tardiness, but it's been a while since we got guests at this late hour. Can I take your name, honey? Granny Royce was smallish, her gray hair tied in a neat bun behind her head, a dress that would have looked like it belonged to a senior citizen in the twenties, and a faded pink sweater. Melinda thought that she looked just like she would have wanted her own grandmother to look, but her mother's mother had died when she was still very young and she'd never met her father's mother. It almost hurt her to deny this sweet little woman her business, but nevertheless, she had to get home. Actually, no, I I'm sorry, she began, but the fact is I'm lost. I I'm not even sure where I am in the direction of... Oh, you poor thing, said Granny Royce. You just sit down and let me fix you some tea or something. You must be cold. Really, thank you, but I I'm okay, Melinda said gently. I just need to use the phone, or if I could, if, you, if you've got a map, that, that would be lovely. I, I really only live a couple of hours from here. She trailed off, not knowing if she was even right about that. 
She easily could have driven those five-plus hours in the wrong direction entirely. Uh, oh, dear, the little woman said sadly. I'm sorry, honey, but all the phone lines are down. As for a map, well, I used to have one, and if I look, I still might. But it's probably quite out of date by now. The highway moved since then, I, I know that much. Melinda's heart sank. How could her luck get any worse? No phone, cell, or landline, and no map. Well, what could she do? She had to get back home. She was expected to work at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And why were the phone lines down? The weather was cold, but still clear. Were they fixing a line nearby? She told Granny Royce the name of her town, but Granny only said, Believe it or not, I I've never heard of that town. What did you say the name was again? So she told her again. No, it doesn't ring a bell. I I'm sorry. But I couldn't say which direction it's in. Uh, why don't you stay the night, sweetie? I'll give you a discount for your trouble. Thank you, that's very kind of you. Uh, but I have to work tomorrow and I need to get back home. I'm not even sure why I'm out tonight. The only reason I had doesn't seem to matter much anymore. Honey, I would advise not trying to drive back that far tonight, Granny Roy said. Why, it's almost three in the morning and you've not had any sleep. Maybe the lines will be back up in the morning and you can call your work and let them know you'll be late. That won't work either, she replied. I'm the opener. No no one else will be there. No, I I'm sorry. I I've really got to leave. I'll head in the other direction until I find the road I was on. At that, Granny Royce's expression, already one of kind concern, seemed to shift somewhat to one of fear. She paused, looking at Melinda as though she wanted to say something else to keep her inside. Finally, she said, reluctantly, All right, honey, if you're sure... Uh, just, you be careful now. Don't speak to nobody until you're back on the road. <laughs> that last warning seemed a little silly. After all, what was Melinda, a little girl? Hmm. She thanked Granny Royce for her kindness and headed back to her car. About halfway to the car, she remembered thinking she saw something moving in the trees again, her eyes scanning both sides of the secluded little clearing area that she was in, looking for anything that appeared to be moving on its own rather than being blown by the slight wind. Still, she saw nothing. Satisfied, she headed for her car, but found that all four tires were flat. God damn it! She leaned down and saw a long slash mark on each tire. Someone in this little slice of green acres had slashed her tires in the time it took her to get out, and she had no way of contacting anyone tonight. Kids from the local farmhouse. <laughs> Gotta be, she thought grimly. Nothing else to do, so you might as well go out at night and slash tires. She stopped and let the reality sink in. She wasn't going anywhere tonight. Well, she had no choice now. She had to stay there the night until morning, when hopefully the phone lines would be up and she could call someone from work to ask them to go in for her, and then AMA to get her tires dealt with. <sighs> she sighed and walked back into the house. She could hear Granny Royce as she was walking back to her room. She'd already turned off the lights. Resigning herself to her fate, Melinda rang the little bell again. That you, miss? She heard Granny Royce call. Yes, it's me, she answered. Sorry to be a bother. My name's Melinda Orton. Sorry to never have mentioned it before. I guess I will take a room for the night, if the offer's still good. Oh, of course it is, dearie, said Granny Royce, re-entering the room and turning the lights back on. Oh, Melinda. Oh, that's such a pretty name, honey. Well, let's get you situated. You put your name and arrival here on the book there, and I'll go get you the key. All the boarding rooms are on the second floor, and there's only a couple left. Hmm. <laughs> There are others here? This was surprising. Not a single car had been in the front lawn when she pulled in. Oh, yes, Miss Melinda. Granny was puttering around in the adjacent room. Mr. Norris, uh, young Calvin, uh, there's a few of us here. She came back with a key in her hand. Just out of curiosity, what made you change your mind? She seemed to brighten as she asked the question, as though relieved that Melinda would stay after all. Oh, it's probably just the local kids getting their kicks, she said. But I found my tires slashed. Granny stopped suddenly, her face again twisting with concern and worry. Then she resumed as though nothing was wrong. Nothing to be done for it, I suppose, she said with an air of sadness. Well, not until morning, at any rate, said Melinda. Then hopefully the lions will be back up. Oh, said Granny Royce distractedly. Yes, hopefully. She led Melinda up the darkened staircase into an empty, quiet hall. Or perhaps not so quiet. 